Ahoy mateys. September the 19th be International Talk Like a Pirate Day. To help you lads and wenches get your swashbuckle on, I have prepared a helpful glossary of pirate lingo. Now, before we cast off, I would like to hear a hearty R. R. Good. Good morning and welcome to the Infrastructure Services Committee meeting of Thursday, September the 19th, 2019. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for being here and acknowledge that we are within the territory of the Seashell First Nation. So uh, the first item is the adoption of the agenda and we have at least one significant change here. Uh, the uh, first delegation has been delayed by float plane troubles, fog in Nanaimo Harbor, I understand. So we are going to move them to the end of the agenda. Are there any other changes to the... Oh, and there's one other change to the agenda, which will be brought up. But under item 8, the voting is all except area A. Sorry, Len. Okay. Uh, any others? <laughs> Any other changes? Do I see a motion? Seconded. All in favor of the agenda? Aye. As amended. Aye, aye. aye. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> All right, so now the first item on our agenda is a delegation from Ed Pedno, Interim Executive Director of the C. Shelton District Chamber of Commerce. That's you? Okay, over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, I did not know it was Talk Like a Pirate Day today, so uh, I'm not going to change my presentation last minute. I'm actually from the west country of England anyway, which is Treasure Island land, so I sound like this all the time anyway. So <laughs> ahoy, me hearties, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> First of all, I'm not a good presenter, so please bear with me. Uh, I don't naturally like uh, public speaking. Um, at least if I do a bad job today, at least they won't ask me to present again. So I've got that on my side. Um, C Shout and District Chamber of Commerce likes to thank the SCRD for the invitation to speak at today's meeting. The ongoing water situation continues to have a negative effect on our members, the broader business community, and the general public. We've been working on this presentation for quite a long time. Um, dates and predates back to our June letter when we were asking about finances of how to pay for a lot of the water projects. Um, we have changed a lot since then, even from last week, because uh, attached to this agenda was an updated water report, so I'm sure we're hear hearing a, a lot later, which I'll be going into about uh, some changed dates, which are very good. Uh, so please bear in mind it has changed a lot. <laughs> Uh, the unseasonal rains in August and September meant no stage four restrictions were needed. Um, as was discussed in the SCRD board meeting, uh, I need to be clear, this was a dodged bullet. With the effects of climate change and accelerating in our inadequate infrastructure, implementing new water infrastructure projects is now imperative. Why is the Chamber here today? As the voice of businesses, we have heard from our members that for most water is the biggest issue they face. For example, we are aware of businesses that have to truck in water during three, stage three restrictions at considerable expense just to keep their businesses alive. This is not sustainable. The key point of our June letter was to encourage you, the directors and staff, the SCRD, to take decisive steps. It's time for you supported where necessary by industrial experts to make decisions that start implementing solutions. To help with this, we're, offered to the, this, we're offering the following snapshot of what we believe should be the immediate actions we can take. First one is uh, controversial, uh, is meters. Um, we know the difficulty in the past with getting uh, that approval for the uh, finance of the meters. Uh, there's been an update in the, in the report which I'll uh, go back to um, on the Church Road or the Grantham Well. Um, that big update before the water report in June stated that it be could be commissioned 2022. The new report now says that will be, could be commissioned in 2020. 
that is, a, that is in the new report that is in the agenda this month. Sorry about that, but that turns out to be a misprint. That is very disappointing yes, to hear. Yes, it is disappointing, yes. That changes our presentation drastically, and yeah, that's very disappointing to hear. That's that such important information that's been handed to the public and to us. I, I, yeah, I, I change our, dras our presentation drastically with that information we're given by the SCIB, so we're extremely disappointed to hear that. I'm going to carry on with my presentation anyway, um, based on the evidence and information that we were given. But for a state, we're extremely disappointed that information is incorrect. Well, uh, the recommend funding meters and the church road well. Um, we said that will be done with uh, AAP. Um, we think that because of the AAP make fail or other funding program, that might be funded by borrowing instead. Um, so we can actually get that done quickly uh, without fear of anything being rejected. The uh, other further projects, um, we think that uh, more independent studies on feasibility and cost for long-term solutions, whether that be Cloholm, Grey Creek Well, interconnecting with Pender to Sackanore Lake, those kind of things. The uh, Golly studies into an interface solution that will serve the coast for many decades. Uh, we recommend um, hold a referendum in early 2020 to obtain voter approval to borrow funds over the cost of construction with a long-term permanent solution to water requirements. This approval is also important to enable applications to be made for numerous grant funding opportunities was also highlighted in the report with uh, many different um, grants and other funding that can be found to mitigate borrowing and even higher rates, although we know higher rates is probably inevitable as well. <coughs> you may have noticed that we have not mentioned the construction of reservoirs in the long-term plan. Um, I know there's a lot of talk in the community, we want a reservoir, we want a reservoir. Through, through our investigations, it seems that reservoirs are extremely costly, costly and by definition have a limited supply and capability. Um, from the new report, we see it's a million cubic meters of water in a reservoir, costing up to or exceeding 20 million. In comparison to other projects that have been looked at, I know a million square cubic meters sounds a lot of water. It's a fraction compared to what the other uh, projects could provide at a lot lower cost as well. Speaking about affordability, we appreciate the financial information provided to, by regional staff in our response to our letter. We agree that any and all of these infrastructure solutions will require a combination of funding sources. Clearly, taxes and or fees will need to be increased to pay for some of these costs. It is the Chamber's view that the electorate will support initiatives that provide assured, reliable water for many decades to come. Give an example of proximate funding. If we're looking to borrow 25 million over 30 years, at 3%, that would average about $127 per year or about $10 per month per household. Although just one example, it highlights that even before taking into account the likelihood of receiving grants and DCCs, the cost of per taxpayer for a large project is relatively affordable. We suggest that level of borrowing could support a total project of at least 50 million. We hope our summary today helps you address the crisis and encourage you to take concrete steps now. While this summer is much better than many of us expected, the coast remains extremely vulnerable until solutions are implemented. As SCRD Board Chair Laurie Pratt stated at the three water dialogues held earlier this year, we are in this together. The Chamber is ready to work together with the Board and all stakeholders. I thank you for the time today and are happy to answer any questions you may have. I would like to further insist um, we were very happy to have a report saying this will be implemented, the first wells implemented next year. Our original presentation that I alluded to earlier was very much different when it said about 2022. I've just learned again that is a mistake and waiting another three years is not acceptable. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. 
and do we have any other any questions from directors director seekers thank you I don't have any questions I think you've summed up our position at this point at this table what we're waiting for as is the community is the information on costs right costs and feasibility and as you read in the reports that are coming forward today we're looking at q4 where we'll be able to have information to actually put forward budget recommendations etc to move some of those projects forward so we're we're in a holding pattern at this point and the information that we're looking to gather some of it particularly with regards to the wells is required by the province and for in order for us to actually make an application to license to add the water to our system so we are we I think as a as a board we've actually moved expeditiously to you know move forward on all of these matters it just it takes time and we're I think we're as frustrated as the community yeah I think you know something that's passed my mind back to my previous presentation that the SED board originally escalated this to a work water emergency and then that wasn't even strong enough and you escalated to a water crisis we would question whether your response has been crisis class as crisis response I say waiting three years is not indicative of a crisis response and I'm just going to say that waiting is not what we're doing we are we are going through the whole process that we are required legally to go through and unfortunately it takes time and the other thing is that you have to do the engineering right the first time the last thing we want to do is rush in build shoddy infrastructure that then falls apart in a few years this has to be done correctly unfortunately it takes a lot longer to dig a well than I ever dreamed of between the requirements of the province for licensing and all the infrastructure planning that has to be done it's significant director Beamish did you want to address this a one aspect that the Gibson's has been working on is the as the upper Gibson zone 3 and we have completed a well and a very good production well on ocean mount and so that we will be bringing that in we have had the second public information session on the AAP that we are doing and that's the one to borrow three million dollars to actually do the construction to take the the zone 3 off of the reliance of the SCRD water and that will put that water back in the system so I'm hoping that by 20 late 2020 2021 that that will be completed and we have to go through and get the final on the AAP we had a total of four people come out to the two public information sessions and that kind of gives us a sense that there's not a lot of controversy on the issue in the community and a lot of support for it so that we are moving forward on that so that helps the regional district situation and would put I believe if I'm not mistaken about 8% of the water back in is that correct during the driest months of the summer it can be up to 10 12 percent okay so that about 10 to 12 percent to the regional district resources it does seem that's the only now the states have been corrected does seem that is the only significant project we can see until the wells are commissioned which seems to be three years time director Pratt thank you of course we share your frustration as you've heard around the table and we do we are bound by some regulatory framework and legislative framework we are doing what we can to highlight where there are backlogs within the system like within the approval system we've been talking with MLA's and highlighting those facts we're continuing to build those relationships and every time we can we're within earshot of an MLA or a minister highlighting that this needs this needs to be dealt with there's reports of one to two year waits for some licenses to be approved even after they've gone through the regulatory process and with us being in this kind of situation we do not 
once we've done our due diligence that we're legislatively required to do, we want to be able to know that we can get in through right away. And that's part of the holdup as well, is once we have everything in place, there's still, there may be a time lag just waiting for it to get approved. And so that's a piece that we can work on, which we are working on and uh, pushing on pressure that way. I'm hoping maybe at UBCM you can give even oh, stronger yeah, pressure on that. List. <laughs> Director Seegers? I was going to mention UBCM. Yes, we. it's actually one of the meetings that's been set up for next week. Treat it as a crisis. To yeah, it is, it is on the list. Um, another piece that hasn't been mentioned here and I didn't see in the reports was regarding the environmental flow needs on Chapman Creek. That is moving forward as well. Um, I don't know what the status of that is at this point. Um, we did know that it was probably not going to be in place for this year, but we're hopeful that that'll be in place for next year, we'll, we'll, which will also reduce the required flow and give us more water in Chapman Lake. Director Hilt. Uh, thank you, Captain. Um, I, I mentioned your, your, the, one of the things that I'm interested in is the value of water. And, and you mentioned uh, trucking in water and, and so, and, and the relationship of water to the economy. And so does the, does the chamber have a me method of kind of like quantifying economy and water and those, uh, how they, those relationships can be described through statistics? Is there anything that you would be able to provide? Not so statistics. We've gone out to reach to our members to say what issues are the, are you being impacted by you know, the water restrictions? And this was a quite one of the biggest ones. We don't really have a breakdown statistics. I've gone to that level. We have limited staff and uh, volunteers on the chamber. Um, but we went out to do reach, and this was one of the, the you know, we chose one of the biggest ones to, to briefly include in our presentation about, you know, they literally have to pay for trucks full of water to come to the coast to, so they can continue operating as a business. It's a hot tub and pool maintenance business. Uh, just, to just to follow up, so um, the sources of the trucking of water, like is there a, like, I, I don't even know where to go out and buy a truckload of water. No, I don't tell you that. <laughs> is, is there services like for bulk water sales for that uh, the um, uh, businesses can hire to bring in bulk water for their purposes? Yes. There, there is services on the coast that will provide that. I, I don't know if it's on the coast or off the coast, to be honest. I can find more details about that. Yeah. We have bulk water sales on the coast. I'll no, just say one other thing that uh, in terms of what we are doing, um, I have a draft of a report called Options for Pursuing a Regional Approach to Watershed Management and Governance. So that's going to be presented, uh, finalizing. The Town of Gibson's taking the lead on that through our administrator and uh, through a, a Zita Bothello Consulting. We have a draft report. Uh, it will be finalized and be discussed with all of the uh, local governments uh, in November. So that is also something that's being pursued actively uh, by by all of us. Yeah, I did see in the report is uh, going to be a thorough update in quarter four of this year, so we'll, we'll be following that with interest. All right, seeing no further questions, thank you very, okay, much, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I say I just want to say again how it did throw me off doing that inaccurate data. I based the you were not alone. I, I looked at that and said, what? Yeah. So, yes. Thank you. Great. All right. <laughs> Everything being ship shape. Uh, I would like to start the rest of our agenda with a motion to receive all of the reports. Motion, second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Thank you. We have received the reports. So, next on our agenda is our general manager of infrastructure with a water supply update. All right, Captain. Thank you, Chair. Um, I prepared a presentation which is loading as we speak. I hope it will work.
Yes, that's better. Okay, thank you uh, for the opportunity to provide an update on the water supply situation as we speak. Um, I think it's no surprise for everybody that uh, it has been raining a lot the last several weeks, especially the last week, which helped us out a lot in terms of our water supply, and I will go into that a little bit later. But before I want to do so, um, I start with a quick overview of the situation at the start of the summer, trends on supply and demand over the summer, um, some update on our water conservation programs and public consultation we're initiating this fall. So this is a graph which depicts the amount of rain received at uh, Shishield Airport um, during the years, uh, during uh, the months until now. You can clearly see that compared to the average for the last 10 years, February, March, May, and June, and even July was at or far below uh, the average situation. August was about average and September was above average until now. So we really had uh, more rain than the average situation, than the average year until now. Um, the dry spring, February, March, May, June, that was really what um, caused a lot of concern in terms of our long-term water supply situation. The asterisks, uh, at the August and September data are uh, because those data are not from the Seashell Airport Weather Station but from our own water treatment plant because the weather station is out of service at the moment and just like all other weather stations in the vicinity uh, are currently out of service and Environment Canada has no indication, has no timeline for uh, fixing them again. So as a result, we're using our uh, own data, uh, which we collected the treatment plant not far away from the airport uh, to, uh, to complete this graph. So this is an overview of the stages as they were called uh, in the last uh, five years. Um, this year we were more proactive in our calling of our stages to mitigate the impact uh, to really to avoid stage uh, the calling of stage four to mitigate uh, to mitigate the impacts of uh, doing so on the community and to ensure that we indeed have sufficient water supply if the drought as we had in, er in the early start of the year would have um, extended until uh, September maybe early October um, and in the weather patterns early this year were really similar to those in 2015 uh, when we went into stage four in um, August. So uh, that's why we were uh, for a long term in stage three and um, were able to move back to stage two at the earliest uh, date ever. If you look at the uh, water, water demand uh, from our treatment plant at Chapman over the years, uh, these are the averages uh, during the different stages um, and in the winter situation for the last four years. If we go from left to right, the left one is the winter situation and the decline there is um, because of course in the winter that's a good a measure for us to, uh, to see what the impact of our metering and leak detection uh, program is, the leak detection program as a result of the metering. So you can see the decline there uh, last several years. Uh, stage one, we were significantly lower this year than previous years, but the big change is, a, is in stages two and three where compared to uh, previous years, we were uh, 14 to 15 percent uh, lower than, um, than uh, last year. And that really um, was the result of a little bit lower temperatures Changes in uh, allowable use, especially during stage two, uh, we uh, think that the change to not allow lawn watering in residential for residential purposes made a big difference here. And of course, the metering uh, always had an, had an impact. Stage four, we were a little bit higher this year compared to, um, no, the, the, 
stage four, we didn't went into sta stage four. Stage four, this, these were the data from 17 and 18, where you see that also in 2018, um, stage four was higher in 18 and 17, which is comparable to at stage three level. So this is the actual daily uh, demand uh, consumption throughout uh, the period from May 1st to um, to, to date, uh, or several days ago, and um, it's if you would compare this to the data from last year, all the numbers were significantly higher, especially during the time when we were in stage three. The moments when we were meeting our target were really the, the moments when we had a rain event, so a limited uh, use of outdoor uh, water supply, water consumption, and otherwise especially during stage three, we were above our target. But I, as I um, explained during the July infrastructure services meeting, um, our targets are set as the ideal situation to achieve. So I think there's more work to do to, uh, for us to see if we can get close to our targets. So July was the wet month compared to the four or five year average. August was actually just about average or a little bit below average. September was far above average. So it was really, it is really July that um, saved us from uh, going to stage four situation this year. And these are the data uh, from Chapman Lake situation. So Chapman Lake, uh, which is also representative for Edwards Lake. Yes. Just to clarify, so the September line uh, for the five-year average, is that the whole month of September or just from the 1st to the 17th? Whole month. Whole month. Okay. And these are the data up at, uh, up at the lake. So this is not what we had here at, um, at, at sea level. So what has been the situation in terms of compliance and enforcement uh, to date. Uh, we had 117 complaints, 53 of them received ultimately a warning, 17 of them a notice of violation, and we issued two fines. Um, not everybody, not all complaints were followed up with a warning because sometimes there was actually no infection. Sometimes we did just did enough didn't have enough information to actually uh, that it weren't uh, a warning to be issued. And um, another thing we implemented this year was door hangers. You can see an example there on the right. Um, we introduced door hangers for situation where uh, a violation was observed by our staff, but we were not able to connect with the residents because it was sometimes at six o'clock in the morning and they were just not opening the door. So we uh, put the door hanger on the door and the voicemails of our staff were full by 8.30 when they got back to the office. Um, really effective way of communicating with staff, with, with residents about um, potential violations. Um, so we're definitely going to continue doing that. And this, this is especially useful for situations where we're doing patrols in the evening hours, early morning hours, where not everybody's willing to open the door when, uh, when we uh, are entering the property to, to have a discussion with people about their uh, ongoing water use at that point in time. So we also engage, try to engage more with our seasonal residents. Uh, we did a pledge campaign with restaurants and lodging um, accommodations around the coast um, and we connected with BC ferries and we supported the ambassadors on the ferries um, and uh, there were notices also um, uh, on the ferries coming in about the water restrictions and we already booked space for next year to uh, have actually advertisement on the ferries coming in about the water stages. And that was necessary to do because there is a one, two year, uh, they are booked so far in advance that we had to book quite early. But that's, um, I think that's, that will be a, a very useful as well. So the plans this 
fall uh, in terms of evaluating uh, our drought management approach this year and uh, consultation with the, with the general public about it. It will be really focused on not only on the regulations, but also on the rebates programs, our outreach, our education, our uh, enforcement, our communication. So it will be broader than only the regulation itself. Uh, the survey, online survey, will be launched on September 30 and will uh, go uh, until October 30. There will be uh, announcements in newspaper, uh, social media, and radio uh, around the survey, as well as on the engagement sessions with the community in Frankwest Hall on Wednesday, October 23rd, and at Let's Secondary School in uh, October 28th, on October 28th. And we're aiming, if all things go right, uh, we're aiming to bring back a report um, with an evaluation of our drive management approach this year to November ISC. So we hope that we can analyze all data in the first week of September, uh, November so we can make that happen. And this was my final slide. More than happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Tice. Thank you, Captain. I, um, I, I, I think uh, one thing that may not have been mentioned, and I think that's very important, is uh, a big thank you to the community for to for the buy-in that they um, uh, that they displayed this summer by these in increased um, or, or the decrease in water use, and uh, I, I think that you know uh, I think our our communications uh, have have done uh, have gone a long way in in, in, hel in helping that, but without buy-in, uh, none of this would be happening. So uh, I, I I really have to thank the community for what they've done uh, over the summer. Director Seegers. Thank you. I'm wondering if staff can update us on the environmental flow need question. Staff, do we have an update? The update is that um, given the fact that uh, it was the need to get that one established uh, became is now less than it was a couple of months ago. It also is a lesser an emergency, a lesser urgency for the for the province to work on, and um, we focused ourselves as well a little bit on other issues. But it will definitely um, be worked in the upcoming months, including in a budget proposal. I just have a question for staff. Um, Environment Canada. You know, the accuracy of their weather forecasts, and particularly their long-term weather forecasts, seems to be pretty dismal. And if their weather stations are out of service, this would suggest that there is a systemic problem there. Do you have any comments on that? I think there's a... I'm not sure if there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the weather station here and their forecasting, uh, forcing, forecasting accuracy. They're using a variety of, I think, 20, 30 models to do the long-term forecasting, um, different models, and they're based there. None of them are is one-on-one -on -one based on, um, on the weather station here. However, the local weather station, they're using that to provide more regional short-term forecast. And that's where, um, and the other thing of concern for us as staff is the, just having that water sta weather station out of service for an indefined period is an issue in terms of trend analysis and uh, seeing impacts to climate change, from climate change, et cetera. So we can use our, the data from our water treatment plant, uh, however, um, there's no guarantee that they have the same accuracy as the data uh, that would be received at the, uh, that would be measured by Environment Canada itself. So yes, it's, con it's of concern for us. So is there anything we can do as a board to advocate with the federal government to reinstate that weather station? 
that would be my question. Uh, perhaps we could write to them, Director Pratt? I would certainly make a motion that we write and ask for that weather station to be, um, to be put back online as soon as possible. Staff, please. My suggestion, it's not only this station here at the airport that is offline, also uh, one at the lighthouse in Mary Island, etc. It's also offline, so there are all there's none on on the southern on this part of the coast currently online, which is um, so there's yeah there's nothing. Okay, I'll amend my. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like the board to, uh, I'd like to follow up and and add an a whereas I guess or and and that all weather stations in the Sunshine Coast area are um, are brought back online. Can you wordsmith that, Tracy, please? Thank you. And we have a seconder for that motion. Uh, Director Lee. Are, are these weather stations actually federal, official federal weather stations? Oh, wow, that's lots of them. Thanks. Director Hill. Uh, uh, thanks, Captain. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, it's nice to see all that data brought together. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, forgive me. Uh, forgive me, Captain. Apologies. Keep it up and you'll walk the plank. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, back to the motion. Any further comments on the motion? Uh, can I see all in favor of the motion? Thank you. That passes. All right. Now, Matey. Um, a gr great presentation. Um, the, the kind of the things that I was seeing is the, the long, this is, looks like the longest stage two. And uh, there has been, it, is the board policy, is, is that our target for stage two as a service level? Like, I can't remember if we've actually said that. Thank you uh, for the question. The water sourcing policy framework as agreed on by the, was adopted in May 2018, indeed in states that uh, the intent is to keep the water, to have a water supply situation that allows for stage two to be the maximum stage throughout the year unless there's an emergency situation. Thank you. Apologies, Captain, for my misbehavior. Um, a, a, a couple things. There is the, the VIU high altitude weather station is, is an alternative, and it's an independent one, and it does provide the weather up, up where the rain is actually being captured by tetra, the tetrahedron. And that seems to be, so are we supporting that in any way? Is the regional district supporting that financially, or what is our support for that weather station and the ongoing trend analysis that comes out of that weather station? Thank you for the question. Um, the weather station that's currently out of service is the one here at um, in the lower reaches. We have our own weather station still at Chapman, at Chapman Lake ourselves, and the one uh, you're uh, you're referring to is the one upstream of that, more in the watershed, and that's the one that we support, uh, we're partnering, and we also uh, primarily use that uh, one for predictions on snow melt and snow levels because that's that's the biggest value for us of, of having that old weather station up there. One last one. Uh, um, I, I'm going to make a statement about the, the concept of dodging the bullet. Um, it's been used a couple times and uh, uh, dodging a bullet is not luck. And I, I think there's been an awful lot of work that has allowed this community to dodge a bullet. Um, is all I just have to look at is the Cowichan River situation, the worst drought situation in 50 years. Um, I think this, this board and the staff in the community are doing a lot to improve our ability to dodge bullets in the future, and that's the resilience. So I really thank uh, the staff in the community and echoing uh, Director Ties. So, um, it, it doesn't, luck is not part of dodging bullets. It's not the only good thing. Staff. Thank you. I would like to um, respond to that uh, or echo that because I fully concur with that in terms of the community response and that's also what we received 
um, in our engagement with the community over the summer. Um, there's a different tone than there was last year as part of that communication, which was, um, yes, we had our discussions with, with residents, but they were of a different nature than most of them last year, which uh, was um, beneficial also for, for staff morale. Thank you. And I would like to say that I'm going to look forward to the feedback from the community, uh, uh, both at the uh, in-person meetings and online. And I hope that everybody will participate and that the businesses particularly will make sure to take the time to, uh, to take part in the uh, online survey and put in their comments and suggestions on uh, how we can go forward with this. So thank you very much. Next item. Item five, General Manager Corporate Services, uh, Water Supply Expansion Project Funding. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan outlines a strategy to address water supply deficit in the Chapman water system by balancing demand management and supply expansion. There are currently three projects underway, which are the groundwater investigation, raw water reservoirs, and universal metering. Each of these projects have different timelines and significant financial considerations. The purpose of this report is to outline available funding as well as funding opportunities related to the water supply expansion projects. Although the focus of this report is on available funding for water supply expansion projects, the water metering program should also be considered in the same context given the estimated cost to complete the final phase of the program. Board direction has already been provided for this for staff and more information is forthcoming in the fourth quarter and 2020 budget. There are multiple sources of funding and funding opportunities available for use towards water supply expansion projects. The most relevant and likely of these include grants, development cost charges, reserves, rate increases, and long-term borrowing. Ultimately, given the projected cost of the required work, it is likely that a combination of all of these sources will be utilized. So as far as grant funding, there are currently four senior government grant funding programs for which project eligibility criteria aligns with the SDRD's water supply projects. There are community works gas tax funds, uh, strategic priorities funds through gas tax, investing in Canada infrastructure program and infrastructure planning grants. Staff continually monitor for grant opportunities and note an increasing emphasis on sustainability criteria that will be used to evaluate future projects. The second source of funds for water expansion are development cost charges or DCCs. The most recent DCC reviewed uh, occurred in 2014 after the adoption of the Comprehensive Regional Water Plan and the bylaw was subsequently adopted in September 2015. The bylaw states that DCCs are collected to assist the SCRD pay capital costs of providing, constructing, altering or expanding water facilities to service directly or indirectly the development for which the charge is being imposed. DCC rates established per the bylaw in 2015 were based on a program which estimated 25 million in full or partial growth related to projects to happen over the next 20 years. The target DCC recovery or the growth related component of this was just over 15 and a half million. The current regional water service DCC balance is almost $2 million and 415 of this is already committed to the Regional Water Storage Capacity Project. It's evident that circumstances have significantly changed since the current DCC bylaw was adopted and the province's best practices guideline recommends that DCC bylaw should be uh, completed every five years. The third funding sources are reserves. The Regional Water Service currently has about 4.5 million in uncommitted capital reserves and 2.8 million in uncommitted operating reserves. Although these funds are not committed to fund projects in the current financial plan, potential use of reserves for water supply expansion projects must be balanced against the future life cycle, future life cycle costs of maintaining and replacing the existing water infrastructure. This infrastructure is estimated at over $180 million replacement cost. 
The fourth source of funding are parcel taxes, which are intended to fund the ongoing capital maintenance, upgrading and renewal, and expansion of the water supply treatment and distribution of infrastructure, as well as any debt servicing costs. In balancing the user fees and parcel taxes currently charged, this would provide additional funding for future capital projects or service uh, future debt servicing. More information on this will be forthcoming as part of the 2020 fees and charges review. The fifth funding source is long-term borrowing through the Municipal Finance Authority. There are a number of considerations which must be factored into any decisions related to funding for projects through long-term borrowing. They must re receive elector approval. Timing of these projects uh, extend over a five-year period, and so timing has to be considered in uh, the project timelines, as well as the SCRD's debt management policy and debt servicing ratios. Regardless of the other funding opportunities for water supply projects, it's virtually certain that a significant portion of funding will be required from long-term borrowing. That concludes my report, and thank you, and staff are available for questions the committee may have. Thank you very much for the report. Um, I'd just like to welcome our delegation. I see that you have arrived. Uh, we have moved the presentation to the end of the agenda because we weren't sure when you were going to be able to get here. And if you are a little puzzled, September the 19th is International Talk Like a Pirate Day, just, just to get you up to date on what's going on. So, do we have any questions from the Hearty crew of the SCRD? Director Ties. Uh, yes, thank you, Captain. I, uh, I have, um, I, I got through, the, uh, through this report, uh, I see two motions that could be uh, actioned here. Um, and the first one, uh, that I'd like to action is, is the motion that staff conduct a full review of DCC issues and methodology and report, report back to the board by, and I'd like to uh, defer to staff as to when they would want to uh, report back to at, at what point. Thank you for the, for that, uh, for the question about uh, input on that one. The, in upcoming months, there will be more clarity provided on um, updated cost estimates for uh, the major projects. Um, for any update to the DCC um, methodology and bylaw to be considered, I suggest to at least um, await those results and to make sure that those can be included. So um, I would suggest to do that in 2020, <laughs> maybe but I would please. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a lot of things, but both the strategic plan, the, the board's new strategic plan also needs to be considered as part of those factors. So uh, depending on some of the timelines and some of the funding strategies as well that are, that are then uh, determined as part of those projects are coming to fruition or construction where the, where the funds are going to be required. Uh, in conjunction to that, there's the asset management planning, so doing the detailed condition assessments of the infrastructure, so really getting a better handle on what the future capital cost needs are uh, in the future for the, for the service. So I, I, would, I would say late 2020 or sometime in 2021, once a little more information is known. Um, and so it's already on staff's radar, uh, but there's, there's a lot of things in place to make sure we do it. Uh, correctly. All right. Um, so I guess we're not going forward with that one. But uh, the second one was uh, that could also be a motion is for staff to review the utility rates in order to achieve 100 percent of tax uh, parcel tax contributions going to capital funding and debt servicing. And um, maybe that's already underway as well. But um, that, that seemed to, uh, I don't know if, if you need board directions for that or if that's just going to happen anyway. If the board wishes to provide direction, they may. Uh, however, that is already something that the staff are contemplating bringing as part of the rate review, which is uh, coming at later this year. Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, in your presentation on page five, where you talk about the parcel taxes, you indicate that parcel taxes, 32% uh, of 
what is uh, brought in through parcel taxes actually goes to operations. Do we know what a 32% increase would look like? Can we give a community a heads up on that? Not quite yet because we don't know what any of some of the projects are going to be proposed. Okay. So what we have to balance is what the future funding requirements are going to be for 2020 and what sources of funds those particular projects will be identified. So once we have more clarity as part of pre-budget um, or as we emerge into budget, we'll have more information on that. Okay. Um, I seem to recall a couple of years back there were some loan under authorizations being done and I believe that was from the water function. Can you confirm that? And if so, are those paid back? So I don't have it right off the top of my head, but the water treatment plant uh, debt servicing uh, was a 20-year borrowing when we constructed that. So I, I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but it will fall off. Uh, so those are some of the considerations as part of how these things will be funded. Uh, we also, uh, if the question to clarify uh, through the chair was if we have any outstanding, because uh, we did have... Uh, yes. Yeah, so we, we were anticipating to do debt servicing for the Chapman expansion. Uh, however, that particular project failed. Um, so uh, there's, there's nothing more to that. So what did I hear you say then that we still have some internal borrowing from the water function for other projects that is still in process of being paid back? Oh, internal funding? No. Yes. Um, it was loans no. under authorization. Okay. Yeah. No. Oh, the loans are, are, are you speaking of the, the recreation? I don't know. That's oh, why I'm asking. Yeah, no. Was it, was it no, water? No, those, those are all paid back. Okay, good. Um, and so those had to do with, uh, we used water reserves uh, to fund some recreation projects um, several years ago, but that was transferred over to Municipal Finance Authority a few years back. So no, those are all intact. Um, just the only borrowing would be short-term borrowing for uh, vehicles, so capital five-year borrowing for vehicle replacements and those types of things, but long-term borrowing is only for the water treatment plant. Thank you. And one final question. Under the debt servicing ratio, you indicate that um, we have a policy that says the maximum debt servicing costs be limited to 15% of the regional district's revenues and that there is uh, approximately $35 million in additional borrowing available based on the rates and terms, etc. Um, we do know that Gibsons has a couple of AAPs that are in process. Um, district of Seashell has some plans for some borrowing down the road. When you look at that number, the uh, 35 million, it, does that include what we know is coming forward or only where we are at this point? So the debt management policy uh, only indicates the portion of the SERD's debt because the member municipal debt, they have to satisfy their own uh, uh, municipal requirements through the community charter. Uh, regional districts don't have to uh, have those same restrictions. Uh, so they're not factored in there. Uh, so we don't factor in the municipal borrowing. So if there was something coming from District of Sea Shelter, Town of Gibsons, that number is not factored in there. Director Hiltz. Thanks. Thanks, Captain. Um, uh, parcel taxes on, on page five. It's I'm, I'm trying to understand where it says intention. So is there a discretion with that intention or is it legislation? Is it a bylaw? What what are the restrictions to how parcel taxes can be used? There's nothing really regulating you, but there's sort of a best practice um, in local government is to use parcel taxes for debt servicing or capital costs. Uh, there's no policy, there's no legislative mandate, but there are some things within the bylaw that says how you can service a function, uh, but it's not prescriptive. Uh, and a follow-up, so the advantages of parcel tax versus user taxes, like for a, a member of the public to understand why I should be doing it one way versus the other. So user fees generally from a, a financial model is user fees are to, to maintain regular operations. Uh, parcel taxes essentially are like a flat tax. Everybody pays the same rate. Uh, user fees, uh, depending on what type of user fees that you have, you have commercial rates, residential rates, you have some, some changes to that. So um, it's essentially an option. Um, uh, those are the differences between the two of them. 
is usually you, you factor in all of what you need to service your operations and you establish a fee for that. And then based on your capital requirements, both uh, maintaining current infrastructure and future infrastructure is sort of your, your parcel tax. Director Pratt. Uh, just a, a quick question on uh, more of an administrative side, uh, just regarding the report and the typo that was in the report. Has the one that's been online been updated uh, with a notation? Because, I mean, yes, it was it was a typo, but at the same time, it was a significant typo um, that uh, uh, has, as we've heard already, has created some angst within the community. We'll make sure that's done later today. Okay, thank you. And maybe even, I don't know what uh, what typically you do, but with something like this, because it is, it's a significant uh, amount of time, it might be worth just putting a quick note just saying that an earlier version had the wrong date in it. It's just a thought. Right. Thank you. had a process question here as to the order of the agenda. So would you, would the board like to see us move uh, the reconcilia reconciliation presentation up to the next item? All right, have we finished this item? Do we have any further questions? We have received the report. There are no actions coming forward. Okay. I'm the captain. We can, we can change this. So, all right. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to invite up our guests, uh, Heinz Dyke and Jennifer Spencer from the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Welcome. Yep, I think so. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks for having us this morning. I'm going to freestyle it then, kind of. <laughs> Good, good morning. Thanks uh, very much for inviting us to this uh, uh, board session. Um, my name is Heinz Dick. I am uh, one of uh, one of the pr provincial chief negotiators for uh, the British Columbia government within the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. I had the uh, honor and pleasure to uh, negotiate the foundation agreement uh, with team members um, with uh, Jasmine and uh, Chief Warren Paul. And uh, Jennifer is with me here today and she's um, very much involved in the implementation of the agreement and uh, getting down to the very specifics of, of how we uh, implement the foundation agreement. And sorry for being late. I know we were earlier on the agenda. Um, the fog uh, delayed our flight from Nanaimo. Thank 
you. Thanks for having us again today, everyone. I'm Jennifer Spencer. I also work with Heinz. Um, I'm working to implement a uh, foundation agreement specifically around the lands transfers. So I'll um, talk a little bit about that today. So um, just for uh, kind of introductory uh, before we begin some objectives for today, um, one, I'd like to provide an overview of the Seashell um, Nation and BC Foundation Agreement with a focus on the proposed land transfers. That's when what was requested of us for the presentation today. Um, I'll outline what I heard, what the BC government has heard from the um, Sunshine Coast Regional District in terms of their interest with the Foundation Agreement on the proposed land transfers and how um, those are being addressed. And then um, I'd like to discuss with you a little bit about um, next steps with the SCRD's involvement in the Foundation Agreement land transfers as we proceed with implementation. So just to orient ourselves a little bit, and some of you may have seen a few of these slides before, but um, just in terms of what is reconciliation, so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada outlines reconciliation as forging and maintaining respectful relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this country, um, awareness of the past and acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted as the atonement for the causes and action to change behavior. And you know, really it's different for each community. It requires understanding at the community level, different perspectives. Um, and to, you know, really to get to their, their a relationship building process is required. So that's really at the root of what reconciliation is and what we're doing here with um, our partner, Seashell Nation. So at a high level, um, provincially, there's some changing expectations um, around the concept of reconciliation and our relationship with um, Aboriginal people. So, you know, it's been expanding from um, a statutory duty to consult and more into a reconciliation um, kind of mindset around acknowledgement of Aboriginal rights and interests. Um, the, Truth and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have called to action and then UNDRIP as well. Um, so we've really had a, a shift in how we're thinking about our, our relationships with Aboriginals in the province. Um, there's many paths to reconciliation. So as you know, you know historically and modern way, modern day, we have treaties that um, are tripartite um, agreements that establish self-government with different First Nations between Canada and BC. It's constitutionally protected, and they define rights to land and resources. So across the province. Many First Nations are in treaty negotiations at various stages. Um, we also more recently have um, what we're calling reconciliation agreements. So more so than not, they're bilateral between BC and a First Nation, sometimes Canada and a nation. And they'll focus really on specific topics and interests that are of interest to the First Nation and you know, the governments. So those, you know, some examples around um, decision making, how that's done. Um, they can include land transfers. They're really specific and they um, can zero in on, on specific topics and you can kind of like build those so you have one then you have another one another five years um, that build off of that um, and you know they can really um, look toward economic and community development um, there's many examples of different collaborative approaches at the community level and then um, there's l many social and cultural innovations for example with the first nations health authorities um, you know, recently, or more recently, the reconciliation agreements have been led by MER, and they're a little bit less focused on social and health, but th those are things that um, we're looking to in the, in the future as well. And, and I think that the, the sky's the limit for that. Um, so between the province and the Union of BC Ministries, um, our municipality, sorry, there's an MOU. It was renewed at the 2018 UBCM convention. And just to reorient ourselves, so these are the things that recommits us to, so um, to local government. So there's particip participation of local government in treaty negotiations and implementation, um, consultation and information exchange on other agreements, such as reconciliation agreements, which I talked about a few minutes ago, and initiatives that are outside of the treaty process. So that's kind of where we fit with these agreements. Um, engagement on matters of mutual interest, including those that may impact local government, ju government jurisdictions. And um, UBCM also fully supports reconciliation efforts between local governments and First Nations. So that's kind of just the lens at which we look at things in terms of our um, discussions with um, the local governments in Seashell and other parts of the province, but definitely um, we're committed to that. 
So shifting a little bit more regionally here, so um, we're talking today about the foundation agreement. So um, for those who may not know, um, on October 4th, 2018, last fall, Seashell and BC entered into a new era in their relationship. So that's transformed and that's through the foundation agreement. So the next couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit about what's in that agreement. Um, but just for context, um, in 1986, Seashell Nation became the first self-governing nation in Canada through legislation which provides um, for provincial lawmaking authority over seashell fan lands. So that gives um, legal rights to enter contracts and sell and dispose of property, um, spend invest or borrow money and powers to pass certain laws and administer and manage lands, tax and other responsibilities. So it's a bit of a unique situation we have here. And, um, and additionally, um, there's one full voting member um, by of Seashell Nation that's on the Sunshine Coast Regional District Board. So I'm sure you know that, but just also telling you what you do. But anyway, just kind of presenting that for the public as well. And just to kind of understand that where we've come from, these are kind of the, the series of agreements that we have. So as I mentioned, the Self-Government Act was in 1986, and then following um, agreements that I'll talk about um, just briefly are all through uh, the bilateral between BC and Seashell Nation. So in 2016, there's what we call the Reconciliation Agreement. That included some land transfers, um, three of them. I think they're Egmont, Salmon, Inlet, and um, Narrows Inlet. So those are the three parcels there. Um, in 2016, additionally, there was a government-to-government -government agreement. And in that agreement, um, there was a commitment that the two parties would negotiate a comprehensive reconciliation agreement by June 2018. So that's kind of where the, the um, stage was set, so where we've come for in those two years. Um, in 2017, there was a forestry shared decision-making pilot agreement. And then preceding that, we have the foundation agreement and then um, also the land transfer agreements, which is more specific to the uh, lands that were agreed to in the uh, foundation agreement. And then there's the Pender Harbor Dock Management Plan as well in um, last year. So some of the key elements that are in the foundation agreement um, include the following. I'll talk just a little bit about those. So there's some lands, as I mentioned. There's three parcels. There's two parcels which we refer to as the gravel lands. So those are um, District Lot 7613 and 2725, and then also District Lot 1592. I'll go into more detail about these later in the presentation, so I won't go into much discussion right now about those. Um, there's also the commitment that BC and Seashell identify and transfer 80 hectares of land for residential purposes, and that would be in the Seashell area. So that's um, a discussion that just has begun very like generally at the table. Um, there is a deadline on that, that we have to have something um, agreed to uh, by, uh, I think it's April of 2020. Um, don't quote me on that, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then also there's um, the commitment to work on establishing some foreshore reserves. Um, additionally, uh, there's an expanded shared decision-making process, and that's between um, Seashells Nation and Flynn Road. That's not something that is being led by our ministry, the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Our ministry itself doesn't actually make decisions. So it's, it's a different line agencies that have legislation where they're authorizing and issuing different um, uses on fan land. So that's uh, where those, in those different ministries come into the different parts of this agreement. So some of those types of shared decision making uh, uh, types are forestry, so that's continued. Um, just recently, um, there's dock applications for private docks, group docks and commercial docks. Those are, that's underway. And in um, the next couple of years, um, we'll also look at additional, um, that acronym that's horrible, but the pronounce is the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources Operations and Rural Development. And there'll be additional legislation that um, they administer um, that follow in the next couple of years, including um, uh, BC parks. Um, there's also implementation funding that BC um, provides with Seashell Nation in the agreement. Um, another, as I mentioned earlier, a big part of reconciliation is relationship building. And so there's a number of different tables that have been established um, and different uh, parties sit at those different tables depending on the topics. 
So one is called Relationship and Implementation Forum. So that is um, basically a, a number of people between the Sea Shelt Nation and different uh, ministries in BC who oversee the implementation of the foundation agreement. Um, there's a land use planning table. Um, there's a resource management table. And then there's also a socio-cultural table. So those all tables are, are at, at different stages of beginning um, and you know various uh, involvement with um, different stakeholders and local governments will be involved and engaged uh, as um, different as different processes unfold within each of those tables. So they're all at different stages. Um, forestry, uh, there's an annual forest revenue sharing. There's funds for Seashell to purchase additional forestry lands. And then in addition, there's another engagement table here. Um, and that's with uh, where you can address strategic and operational forestry issues. So just to, um, <coughs> before we get into the details about the land transfers, I just wanted to show a, little, a snippet of some of the previous engagement we've had with local governments around um, these agreements with the Seashell Nation. This list is not complete. Um, there's different ministries um, in BC that have engaged that, I don't, that our ministry doesn't have um, a full list of, so there's definitely gaps in here that we can work um, to have a better uh, full picture of. And that doesn't also um, acknowledge that there's been countless meetings with Seashelt Nation and the Regional District and District of Seashelt. Um, so there's been lots of engagement of various types. So I've broken out the meetings um, between elected officials, and then there's been uh, a number of local government meetings as well. Um, and more recently, we've been meeting monthly um, with your staff here around some of the interest on the, on the lands, and um, even at this point, it's every two weeks. So the, the relationship has been built, and I'd say it's been a very positive um, relationship, and now we're into trilateral meetings where we're meeting at staff levels, and the discussions have been very positive. So let's transition to into talking <coughs> about the lands um, that are in the foundation agreement. Um, so there's three parcels. Um, just to orient you, the, the magenta color is um, the seashell band land, so the seashell band land is number two. So the three parcels are um, in orange. So the top one um, is District Lot 7613. Okay. So this one. Uh, there's 2725. And between the two, the, this one and this one, they're what we call the gravel lands. And then there's the third parcel down here, which is 1592. Um, just to orient you, this is Dusty Road. This is where your landfill is which is the box C. Um, and then there is your water infrastructure where your treatment plant is, and then there's a number of um, infrastructure that comes down, water pipes, and this is another, this is not included in the transfer, but that's, um, which I think is, I can't remember the block number, but that's also um, where there's a number of your water infrastructure for the, the regional, or for the regional district. Uh, yeah, so these are more specific maps. These are in the agreement, so they're publicly accessible. So um, there's uh, roads that run through these parcels here. I think this is where there's um, a community forest up here, and then there's also um, like a bike. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and then this is, again, the, um, the landfill. And then this is a better look at 2725. And then finally, the light peach here is the 1592. So in the agreement, um, there was it was it's outlined that we will transfer these lands in two different phases. So there's a fair amount of work. Until you do the work yourself, it's it's hard to even appreciate the, the sheer amount of um, work that has to go into such a thing. But um, we just recognize it would take us years and years if we did it all at once. We thought a phased approach might be um, more successful. So we're working on phase one of the transfer, which includes um, 76, 13, and 27, 25, which is, again, these two parcels. So those are the ones we're actively working on transferring. Those are both in the jurisdiction of the SCRD. Phase two of the transfer is going to be a part of 27, 25, which we're um, going to apply to have subdivided. So we'll subdivide um, 27, 25 in, in half. We're not 
half to 50%, but I'll show you in just a second where that is. And then so the transfer would include that as well as 1592. So the subdivision we're applying, we will apply to have that along this line. So this will, go, this will be in phase one and everything here below would go in phase two. So let's shift into talking about some of the interest that we've heard from the SCRD um, in terms of these um, land transfers and we can talk a little bit about um, your, your concerns and how we've addressed those or how we're in the process of, of addressing them. So um, we heard from you a little bit about your interest in collaborative relationships. So um, you've asked to work collaboratively with the province and Seashell to address and resolve some of those interests. So as I mentioned, we will be meeting monthly, if not like bi-weekly on some of these topics to get to an agreement where all three parties have um, consistency and agree to those um, solutions. Uh, we've asked for um, support on, um, for the regional district to have support on public messaging about the agreement and some of the implementation updates. So we've worked closely with um, Seashelt and the province and different ministries to have messaging that we've given both to the district of Seashelt and the Sunshine Coast Regional District so everyone's on the same page, can have the same answers when the public asks you about certain things. Um, and then we've also asked, um, been asked just to have the same kind of level of engagement with the district of Seashelt, which we have been and will continue to do so. Um, there was a concern um, shared that the a part of the dump on um, the landfill extends beyond the actual parcel of Block C. So there's currently a survey being done on the land, and then if that is the um, if that happens, then I, there's some options we have um, to address that. It, I don't I don't think anything too serious in terms of um, consequences, and I believe uh, an option could be that. Um, we just increase the size of Block C so you get a little bit larger. Um, the dump just becomes larger and Seashell will not receive that land. So we don't transfer landfill to Seashell Nation. <laughs> Sounds like a jurisdictional nightmare. <laughs> um, additionally, you asked about access to the landfill and the lands beyond. So I can confirm that um, these lands, these roads all in yellow here, on the parcel, those are going to be remaining as crown corridors. So those will continue to be um, administered and owned by the Ministry of Transportation. So um, there'll be full access um, to all of the um, adjoining lands and to the landfill. So that shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay. Over 7613, a portion of that has. Um, called the Chapman Creek Community Watershed. So the water, um, the water supply for the Sunshine Coast comes out of that Chapman Creek. So there's some diversion points there and there's just concern about um, future use and um, ongoing just water quality protection. So the, there's ongoing discussions about that and when we have something that we can bring to the regional district as a possible solution, we'll do that. Um, one of the, the big topics of uh, discussion that we've been having in our staffing meetings is about the Chapman Creek Water Treatment Plant and Infrastructure. So the regional district has a number of infrastructure across District Lot 2725 that includes a treatment plant, pipes, pump hoses, storage roads, different access points, um, and then in, in addition the diversion points are on an adjacent parcel up river of where Chapman Creek runs through that. So um, in the um, land transfer agreement, um, there's a section in there called per, what's called permitted encumbrances and that essentially means that um, the parties agree that there will be some um, type of registered uh, legal instrument on title of the land when it's transferred as fee simple and there's a, a point, uh, it's addressed here in that, in that table where there'll be a replacement legal instrument that's um, suitable both to the Seashell Nation and the Sunshine Coast Regional District. So that's specifically the work we're working on right now to identify what is that legal instrument and what are the what are the details about that. Without saying much more than that, I'd just say like it's been very positive and I think we'll, we'll find a solution that works really well. Um, you did mention uh, your just awareness of the fact that there may be a subdivision of 27, 27, 25. And again, potentially if there is some inc 
encroachment of the landfill on 7613, we would need to do a subdivision. So those are just things you flagged and we agree that we'll um, come back and talk to you about that in the next month or so once we know a little bit more about what those subdivisions look like. But we have full, our full commitment to engage with you thoroughly on those. Uh, another um, interest you had uh, was about zoning and so you requested a clarification that zoning applies to fee simple land transfers. So that's correct when these lands transfer to Seashell they will be fee simple and your local zoning will apply. Um, what's different there is then when um, if Seashell chooses to transfer those lands to become Seashell band lands local zoning does no longer apply because those would be federal lands. So that's a little that's a little different. So. Um, there's definitely a relationship kind of um, solutions you could have there by working with Seashell about your interests around um, adjacent zoning and, and appropriate uses. Um, again, additionally on the lands we haven't even started working on 1592 we have waterworks uh, also on those properties on that property and there's also interest you have around accessing the lands beyond for emergency purposes, et cetera, and we, you, we have, you have our full commitment to work on those issues when we start those discussions. So as of now, we haven't addressed them, but for certain they're on our radar and we have um, interest to work to get a solution that works for all parties. Yeah. Sure. So for the zoning, um, zoning applies for on fee simple lands. So once they're transferred, they will apply, will apply. Once the if Seashell chooses to transfer their lands from fee simple to Seashell band lands, the local zoning will no longer apply. Yeah, you're welcome. So current progress around um, some of these topics, I've probably addressed most of this, but I'll just get a little bit more detailed about um, what we're doing with the treatment plants and infrastructure. So um, together, MER, um, Seashell Nation and the Sunshine Coast Regional District staff, mostly um, Rumco and Ian Hall, we've been working on suitable arrangements um, for when that land becomes fee simple. So together, we've identified all of the infrastructure that's related to the water treatment plant in physical locations. We have that understood and agreed to, and we also have identified all access um, that's required to the sites. And we are having ongoing discussions which are trilateral to determine the best legal instruments and boundaries to meet all needs and legal requirements. And we also are working on setting target dates for agreement on these legal instruments and boundaries. And we're working um, behind the scenes to get approvals from the different elected officials with all the parties to get agreement on those um, deadlines or target dates, let's call them. Um, Additionally, Chapman Creek Community Watershed, I mentioned there's ongoing discussions between Murr and Seashelt Nation about maintaining water quality of Chapman Creek and we will um, update you as um, that conversation proceeds. And then finally, upcoming types of engagements that we'll um, be looking to have with the Sunshine Coast Regional District, specifically on the foundation agreement land transfers are on that subdivision of 2725 and po quite possibly 7613 if the, there is encroachment by the, that landfill. Um, so we'll, we'll open up the, that dialogue in the next little bit with staff. And then additionally in um, maybe the next half a year or so um, when we turn our attention to 1592 lands, um, we'll engage as well on a number of interests that you've, you've shared with us. In terms of a a timeline. I don't want to publicly be committed to anything here, but you know we're working our hardest behind the scenes to move these things along. Um, I think if we can meet those target dates that we've set internally, probably the earliest we could see the gravel lands, which is phase one, to transfer would be summer of 2020. Probably um, like the best case scenario, but you know I am a glass half full kind of gal, so I'm going to stick with that date and see how we go. all I have for you today. Um, Heinz and I would like to accept any questions or discussions that you may want to um, bring forward. 
All right. And do we have questions from the directors? Director Pratt. Um, I'd just like to start with um, really just a comment. Just thank you so much for coming and um, and uh, and presenting and and especially in a public forum to be able to to present the um, some more information about this. It's uh, it's very really helpful for us as newly well. We're still kind of newly elected in that honeymoon phase, understanding more about the agreement and um, and, and just really appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's it's. Um we're glad to be here to be opening that dialogue. I mean, it's been happening behind the scenes a lot with staff, but for sure, as well with you, as, um, and we continue to welcome your advice. Director Seegers. Thank you. Uh, first, I think, do we, will we have a copy of that presentation available yes. to us? Perfect, thank you. All right, I have, I've been writing notes all over here, so. Um, as you know, we have a community forest in Sea Shop. Yes. And there is the, I think you called it a forest license engagement process. I didn't quite, yeah. quite capture that. And I'm wondering, uh, given a number of overlapping jurisdictions and, um, I guess, interests. Mm -hmm. So the, for one is the Chapman Watershed, for example, the community forest has the logging rights in there. They've Put a moratorium on that. So, how did how did those conversations with those other interests also play out in here? Um, I'll take a stab at it, and uh, if it's okay with the board, I, I turn to uh, Jasmine for some uh, input as well, because she's um, having much more regular contact with the. Uh, major licensees, but the intent behind that uh, particular table is to deal with uh, major four and A and E trading prim primarily. Am I correct in that? And BCTS, of course, the yeah, BC uh, timber sales, and uh, to talk about uh, uh, you know opportunities um, uh, for sea shark and uh, you know expanding their uh, forestries or dealt with. That because what the agreement does it does provide uh, funding and um, to Sea Shark and uh, Sea Shark really uh, very much interested in increasing its uh, commercial uh, um, access to volume um, and uh, you know was, was talking to uh, the majors as we call them and they're trading in, in the forest. Um, I, I you know. Oh, I won't speak for Jasmine, but you know the community forest. Uh, you know I don't think that that's uh, being part of it at all. So I mean it's just sort of discussion and around uh, people's interests in you know expanding the sea. So it's much more about um, how those major licensees interact with the nation and how you know the potential. I'm just going to suggest that you move the mic into the middle okay. because, uh, you know, we do post these recordings. So yeah, we'd like to capture it. Thank yeah. you. Mm. So perhaps when the – so I'm the mayor in Seashock. So perhaps when we move some of those conversations forward there, we could potentially have some conversations around that so that the community forest is aware of how this will impact them as well because – they have no idea at this point. So there's some questions that are just in that realm out there. Um, I want to take one more and then I'll pass it over to the others. Uh, you have been talking about the water treatment plant and the infrastructure. Is, is part of the discussion also around potential lands for expansion of the water treatment plant or just the current footprint? Right now we're just addressing the current rights. So that's really what we're looking to um, secure. Um, moving forward, those types of conversations would be like a, a direct um, discussion between the regional district and Seashelt around what that expansion looks like. So that would be like an, a, a new um, water right that they'd be looking for if there was any expansion, and that um, wouldn't be something BC would be a part of. Yeah, but but I will I will say like at the table, some of those discussions are sort of coming up, but we're sort of like putting those in that pile, and then we're really dealing with like the current rights. Director Ties. 
Yes, uh, I echo uh, Director Pratt's um, big thank you for uh, for being here, and uh, it, it certainly is uh, enlightening, and it, it, it helps. I read through the foundation agreement, but it's it's nice to see pieces that actually do affect us and, and seeing the context. So, um, uh, one question I have is is uh, and, and maybe that's of staff is if any of our proposed reservoir sites are within those. Uh, Within those lands, and, and how that would change the, um, the the process of getting those underway, um, and then yeah, I'll start with that one. Thank you for the question. The reservoir sites itself are, uh, which are, are under consideration, are all outside of these lands. Some of the associated infrastructure to get the water from any of those reservoirs to our treatment plant might need to cross uh, the uh, small corner of the land. And then my, my second question would be, um, uh, as I'm aware, is that, that Flynn Row and uh, uh, is gearing up for a land use planning process with the Seashell Nation and, um, and other nations as well. And, and I'm, I'm wondering how MIR fits into that whole framework and, uh, and, and whether that's sort of a, whether you're involved at all or is, if that's just a, a strictly fun role Seashell Nation thing or not. Uh, we will be involved somewhat, uh, but um Really, uh, land use planning, sort of the getting into the details of that, is uh, um, it'll be a, it'll be a, um, a strong partnership between Mer and Flinrow, um, because there are there will no doubt be some you know significant negotiations that occur through that land use planning process, and uh, so we'll, we'll be joined at the hip. Director Seegers. Thank you. I know the foundation agreement is public. I mean, it's on, you know, I mean, I've gone on and read it. It's been, you know, others in the community have read that. Is the land transfer agreement as well a public document? It is, is yes. yes. Okay. So you just do a search for that and find that one as well? Because that would have the timelines, et cetera, that you have agreed to inside of that, correct? Yes, that's correct. There's, okay. I think the timelines are specifically for the residential grants. I have a copy in my bag. I can show you after. Okay, perfect. That's one. And then the other, when when we had the presentation last uh, last time with council, mm -hmm. previous council in Seashell. The district of Seashell. District of Seashell. Yeah. Yes, there was talk about capacity, so staff capacity, both with the nation and with the province. And there was a commitment on behalf of the people that were there at that meeting from MER to provide support both um, at the province level and at the nation level. And I'm wondering how that's proceeding. Can you clarify uh, support, um, financial support? No, staffing support. There, at that, that time it was indicated that there wasn't sufficient staff at the provincial level to actually move some of the projects forward in a timely manner and positions were looking to be filled. And then there was also I don't know what the staffing level at the nation side would be, if that was financial for them to hire mm -hmm. to help facilitate. So I'm just wondering where that piece lays. Um, we'll have to check on the, and get back to you on that. Was that discussion in April of 2019 or a different date? I was at that meeting. I don't recall that discussion. I don't remember. There, it was a whole group of people, there were Paul and... Um, maybe right there was there were a whole group of people this at the year. meeting. Uh, I think it was last year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Director Hiltz. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I'm just looking for a little bit of a kind of a provincial context. Foundation agreements are going on in other places in BC, and then the piece that you said that this is a unique situation because of the, the special self-government. So I'm just trying to understand the relationship to the province, other foundation agreements, and how it, this situation is unique compared to the other areas. Um, you're right. There are other um, 
negotiations underway elsewhere in the province. Um, they, some are referring it to it as a foundation agreement as well, but they're not, by any means, there's no sort of template out there or, you know, that they'll follow the same kind of uh, um, issues. Um, they'll be very unique. Um, there are, you know, very active negotiations, for example, with Lake Babine, um, and they're calling that a foundation agreement, but they're very unique uh, issues associated with uh, that nation and in that area. Um, so, th I mean, this is, uh, these discussions, these negotiations uh, with Seashells are, are um, unique from the perspective of, of the, the Self-Government Act and, and the fact that they're, um, you know, a member of this uh, of, of this board and and have um, and all the unique factors uh, within the, within the territory. So w that's one of the things that uh, w with um, the current uh, provincial government is uh, allowing the flexibility to move away from more perhaps rigid. Uh, treaty negotiations only or this type of an agreement um, we're, we're provided with more flexibility to to go in and have discussions about what the key interests of the nation are and see if we can design and come to an agreement on their specific interests. Director Lee. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> You were brave flying in the fog, or did you wait until it went away? <laughs> well, uh, they determine when we fly, so <laughs> we, we trusted them. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, I was curious. You mentioned um, principles uh, while you were negotiating the agreement, and uh, I think Heinz, you're the uh, principal negotiator, probably that was there. Yes. Yes. And uh, Jasmine and Chief Paul. Yeah. Was there someone from uh, Forest Lands Natural Resources? Yes. Well, could you tell us who they were? Or if they're uh, just the chief negotiator, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, um, Richard. Uh, Richard. Elliot. Elliot. Oh, he's, <laughs> he's moved on to a different position, and uh, so I'm blanked out on his name. Who else was there? At the time, uh, there were a number of uh, uh, Flinro staff uh, coming in and out. Um, uh, Kevin would not have been really engaged, that engaged at the table, but uh, certainly Richard, um, Elena Farmer, when she was with uh, uh, Flinro, she's since now with the Ministry of Transportation and, and Infrastructure. She was there as well. So, yeah. Well, was there any other uh, government departments present? Uh, on occasion, we had multiple uh, sessions. I'll have to think, um, but I'm not sure there were. Okay. Yeah. I, I just knew uh, I had a friend that was uh, at the treaty table. He used to represent the federal at the fisheries, so oh. I was trying to understand the two how it both worked. Right. So this, uh, the federal government was not involved in these discussions. We, uh, we both um, actively uh, sought their involvement because there are a number of issues that we would like to deal with uh, together with the federal government because they have, you know, obviously they have jurisdiction over fisheries and, and other matters that are of, of keen interest to the nation. Uh, but uh, they have had some discussions with, uh, with Seashelt on their own. Um, and uh, so hopefully at a future date we'll, we'll kind of come together um, as, as three parties and, uh, and begin negotiating some of the other issues that we need the federal government at the table for. Thank you. Director Hiltz. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, the question is about the Crown Corridors. Uh, the Crown Corridors will be in the M Moti's jurisdiction. So is there is part of the negotiations about uh, standards of maintaining the roads, like 
um, roads are an issue on the Sunshine Coast, and if it's a Modi road, and is it going to be maintained? Is that part of the negotiation, or is that something outside of the scope? It's outside the scope of the negotiation, but we have had some just more informal conversations um, more recently with um, staffing here and also with Modi around what that arrangement looks like. Um, I defer to your, to your colleague to just get the details about that, but um, I, I, I believe it seems fine, and there's some follow-up items around um, discussion around the maintenance yeah uh, the nature of the negotiations between between us were really around the width of the roads and if all of the roads mm -hmm. were actually required to be excluded that was the nature of the discussions I just have a question of course we also are within the traditional territory of the Squamish First Nation um, do you know anything do they have any processes in place like this? Uh, not really. Um, Squamish um, is, and I, uh, um, I, I also have uh, had some negotiations with Squamish um, over the years. They're um, they're in a, uh, I think, in a different in a different place. They are are very much focused on many of the the uh, projects in in their territory um, uh, including some very significant land um, uh, potential develop well the development areas I'm sure you've heard of it in in the, in the press the Jericho lands and others which they are in partnership with their uh, neighbors um, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh so they uh, they have so far, um, over the last many years, they've been very focused in on individual projects, individual initiatives, and they were. I was involved uh, with with them on uh, negotiating a wood, uh, an agreement regarding wood fiber LNG. So, again, but it, they've been project focused um, as opposed to a broader. Uh, foundation agreement or reconciliation agreement type negotiation. <coughs> Director Beamish. Hi, good morning. I'm actually the mayor of Gibson, so this doesn't, we're not that close here. So, but a couple questions I have uh, because of the regional district perspective. Uh, what is the status of these lands? And you may have already said that uh, after the, the, this negotiation and agreements in place. What, what does become the status of these lands? Are they part of the reserve area? Will they be taken into reserve? Or? Uh, when, they, when those lands are transferred on the target date of 20, um, summer 2020, those will become fee simple. They'll all be fee simple, okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, but within, we, we, we don't change the jurisdiction through that. So they're still under the zoning um, and, well, and regional district jurisdiction okay so that doesn't occur through that transfer now we've already indicated provincially that we're supportive of those lands becoming SBL lands so okay. then but we also um, um, wish to engage on a number of issues related it's, it's not just automatic it, there, there there will need to be further discussion and about how we do that and we can't do that unilaterally as well. The federal government needs to be on board for that. And that was my second question was that uh, is we are involved in a lot of strategic planning and long-term costly projects. Uh, losing or taking lands out of the SCRD, would that have any financial implications on our projections of uh, revenues? And that would be a question. Um, I would, uh, well, I guess the question back to and perhaps to staff is, you know, uh, what revenues are are coming to the regional district from these lands currently? So, um, and I would, crown lands um, within the regional district, I don't think they generate any property tax. So, um, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure what uh, the regional district would actually be uh, foregoing with respect to revenues. Potential revenues, perhaps, but the uh, current revenues, um, I'm not sure uh, there is anything right now. 
Okay. It is now 11.15. Director Lee, did, I, I'm just going to encourage us to wrap this up fairly soon. Thank you. Director Lee. Actually, it's a curiosity question. Our, uh, our Sea Shelt Nation uh, neighbors here, they have two hats. <laughs> they have one at the provincial level on the decision making, and then they have another hat where they participate with us in the local decision making. Is, there's the, the agreement's very light on details around that aspect. And um, how do we find out if there's been a change in the relationship or not? Because you can't tell by reading the agreement. Um, any thoughts on that? So specifically with respect to decision making, I mean that's uh, that's something that we're now getting into discussions on about how, you know, um, uh, how that might change in the future, how we could um, um, identify um, particular uh, subject matters or, or issues where we would we would uh, make some changes with respect to that. So that. Nothing has been decided upon. We're really in the early phases of uh, identifying potential um, areas, uh, not geographic areas, but subject matters that, that we would uh, look forward to, um, you know, uh, seeking the, the mandates in order to change. So nothing's been decided. Uh, we're in that process of trying to figure it out. Right. No. Any further burning questions, Director Lee? Um, no, I'm satisfied you're, now. Thank you're, you. You're, you're Thank good. You. Is is everybody happy? I would uh, staff, please. Uh, okay. I would I would like to. Okay. One more. Um, it, it's one about the consultation. Um, during the uh, development of the foundation agreement. Um, I was trying to find out the previous board's position on it, so I went through all of the, uh, all of the um, documentation available, and, and it's very thin. Um, is, is there other documentation available other than what we would have here at the SCRD? Because I, I don't understand the the part that the previous board played in the development of the foundation agreement, and I haven't been able to figure it out. Um, we would have, uh, in our records, we would have uh, documentation of the meetings that we had, and then the sort of perspective of the province on how those discussions were, and any kind of correspondence we received from the previous board, we would have on hand as well from, I think usually we received written um, interests and concerns, and so that all information we would have available. Um, so I guess if it's not in on your records, we could look to kind of share that back if that um, if there's a gap in your documentation. Uh, yes, uh, anything that could help me understand the uh, consultation process that did occur. Um, it, sorry, uh, staff has a comment. We will provide the information. We, we have all the information they have on record we have as well. We will make sure that it's circulated uh, amongst the directors. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. It is now 11.20. I think we will drop anchor for a grog break. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, and we'll be seeing you later. Thank you. This is my opportunity to say that the floggings will continue until morale improves. <laughs>
Okay, folks, we have a significant agenda to move through. I'm hoping we can get through the next few items fairly expeditiously because we also have an in-camera after this. So the next item is item six on our agenda, transit fare review. Do we have an introduction from staff? Thank you. Thank you, Chair McMahon. The purpose of this report is to seek direction to initiate a fare review, review process with BC Transit. The current fare structure is in place since May 2016 and consists of a cash fare, a package of 10 tickets at a reduced rate, a day pass, and a monthly pass. The monthly pass is also available at a reduced rate for a senior and students. Staff are recommending to request BC Transit to undertake a fair review to inform the board on the financial impact and impact to ridership and uh, of several changes to the current fare structure. These changes could include the introduction of the option to purchase a day pass on the bus instead of the current only pre-sale, an adjustment to the fares to enhance the ratios between the day and monthly passes and the cash fare, and a further reduced rate for youth to promote them to take transit to go back and forth to their schools. BC Transit will be able to complete its fare review in Q4 2019, which would allow for its result to be discussed by the board late 2019, early 2020. If the board subsequently decide to alter the fare structure, the following steps would need to be taken before these can be actually can be implemented. We would need to amend our annual operating agreement with our partner BZ Transit, we would need to update bylaw 626 our transit and fee charges bylaw and uh, of course the implementation and communication uh, around um, the updated fare structure which would include uh, reprinting of rider guides etc etc. Therefore the earliest date for an updated fare structure to be implemented would be April 1st 2019. Staff will be pleased to answer, answer any questions the committee might have. Director Pratt. Thank you. Uh, so I have a few questions. Um, the first would be, um, how do we track uh, children under five that are riding the bus uh, with an adult right now? Um, the answer is not. Okay. Uh, so, uh, your timeline suggests uh, for a fair review, it's, uh, if we wanted to implement any kind of new fare structure at this point, it, um, and doing a fair review, the timeline suggests doesn't give us until the end, it, we're looking at the end of the school year, so it's not gonna help any, any students in this year. Um, but what could we do about instituting a pilot program that we could start as soon as possible um, and you know whether or not it's like November, December, January one that we could start within the school year, and see how this works prior to going into a full fair review. Thank you for the question. Um, it has been confirmed. We've done uh, internal some um, analysis, and I confirmed with BC Transit as well that even for the establishment of a pilot project. Our bylaw would need to be changed and the AOA would need to be amended. Our agreement with them would need to be amended because as a partner, um, they need to agree as well to, to the fact that we undertake a pilot project and that that could have an impact on, um, on ridership and revenue. Thank you. And what would be the timeline on that? So the, the, the earliest we can do that would be still um, BC Transit indicated April 1st because that the annual date for renewing uh, their our agreement with them. Uh, if we want to do it earlier, uh, it would require the consent from uh, BC Transit that they um, amend the AOA once or two months earlier. But that's that's all we maximize maximally could gain here. It's really the updating of the transit agreement, uh, agreement with them as well as um, our own bylaws. And I think to that note is that the fair review would also give us an indication of what the financial implications would be. And um, otherwise it would be 
going into a pilot without knowing the financial implications. If I can continue. So to, to clarify, if we wanted to introduce a youth pass, family pass, any kind of new product, or institute a free pass, we still need to go through this fair review process with BC Transit. That's correct. Okay. So um, as in the letter that's presented there, um, uh, that's part of our package as well, as well as um, uh, within the uh, parents' uh, letters at the end of our package, there's um, uh, the suggestion of approaching the school district and working with the school district um, to maybe use some of their uh, work out an arrangement for uh, with them with purchasing bulk pass passes and um, with a reduced rate. Have has staff looked at any of that yet? Um, because if not, I mean that's certainly something we can look at as well. More discussions with the school district around the transportation fees. Thank you for the question. In terms of, um, we have not not discussed this with BC Transit directly. What BC Transit, um, as long as there are no implications to our overall revenue, that's, that's for them the primary one. So as long as it's budget neutral, any changes should be budget neutral. I think it's an, um, it will be an easier process um, to get them on board than if there would be any changes to the overall revenue. Anybody else have questions before I? All right, I just uh, have an observation. I would like to suggest that we uh, change the concession fares because right now it's for both students and seniors and we don't know how many students and how many seniors so when I, I take it you can't delineate between the concession fares to know how many seniors are traveling versus students. So it would be helpful if we had two different categories, even if the fares are the same, so that we can gather the data and find out what impact you know we're going to have on, on ridership. Uh, Director Seegers. Thank you. Uh, first paragraph on page 9. Indicates, I mean, it reads, while BC Transit develops fare products, it's the sole discretion of the SCRD board to determine which fare products are offered and at what price for the SCRD transit system. Uh, the transit fees and charges bylaw includes the fare products and prices that are in place, but it also says fare revenue is not shared with BC Transit and it used, is used by the SCRD to offset the cost of providing transit service. So given that it's at our discretion what products are offered and that the fare, the fare, the fares received, money stays here. We know that we will probably have to subsidize that. I'm wondering why it was going to require then um, a change in our operating agreement and why we would have to wait that long to implement it, knowing that we will probably have a deficit and would have to cover that off at some point somehow, potentially with increased taxes for next year. So that would be my question. Thank you for the question. And um, the paragraph and what's included there is correct. Even though the fair revenue is currently not shared with BC Transit and it's to our discretion, they still have a role to play in terms of as a partner, as a, as, as a partner in the system uh, to agree to that. Um, it's also relevant to note that um, they have uh, a vision on uh, an experience, of course, but also a vision on what kind of fair projects, products they would like to see. Um, uh, they th know that are beneficial to have in most communities to increase ridership. And it's also an, an opportunity to, to use that experience uh, in terms of as, uh, assessing um, any impacts. Um, and that's also related to the um, advanced fare collection, fare collection system, which would allow for um, to use electronic payment at the buses. In order for that to be implemented, there need to be some kind of standardization of fare products. 
and uh, that would need to be considered as well, and that would be considered as well as part of uh, a fair review by the by BC Transit. Director what, is, what is the timeline they've indicated for electronic implementation? If we would not uh, significantly change our current fare structure, um, we would uh, be able to be one of the early adapters of that system. And that could be uh, 2021. I'd still like to see something move forward this school year. There's an impact in the community. I don't know how we make that happen. What if we put forward a request to BC Transit to um, modify our operating agreement? I think the request can be made, um, but I think um, they would, one of their requirements would, would be that they would like to know what the impact what the, what the expected impact would be on uh, on ridership and and uh, the financial implications, and um, they are they are on standby to start a fair review tomorrow, um, so we can expedite that process, and we can see uh, if a fair new any changes to the fair structure can be implemented prior to April, but um, prior to April first, so that there is a several months more this uh, in the school year that uh, a new fair structure can be in place. I just have a question. Is it within our powers to offer a special deal to the school district for a bunch of concession passes? I mean, could we do that? Could we say we've got a special sale on? <laughs> if you want to buy them on the cheap, we'll give you this many hundred or something. Is that Can we do that? I would have to, the, the arrangement, the potential arrangement with um, uh, with, BC, with the school district would have to be, I would, we would staff would need to look at that further. Regardless, it would require a change to our bylaw, but I'm not sure if that would change, uh, if that would also require a change to the AOA. I would have to uh, discuss that. But our bylaw would need to be updated anyway. Because our bylaw is our, uh, it's our uh, authorization to actually collect money for the service, so that's why that, that needs to be uh, updated, regardless of what we do. Director Pratt. Um, so, okay, so do we currently give out free passes or do discount deals or bulk discounts um, already for any groups, any user groups? Um, is, is that a budget line item? Is that something that we've discussed in the past? I'm really curious. I know the school district purchases, uh, purchases a number of uh, passes for the alternative school, school students. Um, so they're already, uh, they're already one of our bulk purchasers. Um, uh, do we need to go through a full bylaw process in order to provide a discount deal to them? I'm, I, I question that. Um, and are we not already providing free passes or do we not already provide free passes other places for community organizations or, you know, uh, anywhere else? Do we have any mechanism for that already? We're currently not providing free passes. Okay, folks, can, can, can we get a motion on the floor? That would be helpful to further this. Do I hear a motion hovering out sure. there? Director Seegers? Um, okay, let me do this. I think we want staff to investigate a mechanism to move forward discounted youth passes in an expedited manner as possible and bring back the direction to the board as to how to proceed to make it happen. Staff, please. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to jump in at this point in time. 
What I would suggest as um, as potential recommendation is to have the one that's currently in the report to uh, request BC Transit to undertake the fair review um, and uh, bring the report back to the committee at a future committee meeting, which would allow that to be flexible <laughs> as soon as possible, as well as and that uh, staff um, uh, work with school district uh, 46, as well as with BC Transit on reduced fare system, uh, redu reduced fares for youth, um, and that both um, which would allow both results to be uh, presented at the same committee and then it's for the board up to decide which one in terms of implementation timelines and financial impact can be, uh, can be, um, is preferred. Thank you. Does the bosun have that written down? No? Sorry, sorry Tracy. Can I comment on the revision to the motion I put forward? Yes. Um, what, I, what I don't hear, I mean, I understand the process that you're saying that we that we would need to have kind of happening behind the scenes. What I don't see in there is um, having it happen now, having it happen in a month or two rather than, you know, 2020, 2021. What I'm looking for is how do we make it happen, like, before the end of the year? So whatever process you know, is, is in your motion here, that, that the recommendation that was put forward here, I don't see meeting the request that I'm hearing at the table here. So what I'm saying is how do we meet the request of having it come forward before the end of the year? And maybe some of this stuff happens too, but how do we make it happen? So, so I don't know how you, so I'm not in favor of your revision to my motion that I put on the floor. <laughs> that could be an addition to it. <laughs> but not in place of it. So we don't have a seconded motion on the floor at this point. Director Pratt. Um, well, I'd like to, I'd like, number one, I, I support what um, Director Sears is saying. Um, and I would like to encompass not just youth, but family. Uh, because we want to encourage families on, on transit as well. Um, and with that, I think I would second. I would second. But. All right, this is getting complicated, it folks. Uh, I'm going to go to Director Beamish just for a minute here. I guess, <laughs> I guess I'd just like to ask the question, are, are we comfortable making a decision uh, of this nature without knowing the financial implications on the transit budget that we've already approved. And I think that's something we really need to know before we can say, yeah, let's give everybody a free ride. You know, as a senior, I had a great day yesterday. I went into Vancouver on the bus. I came back. I gave my driver's license, got a re free ride back on the ferry. And the one thing that I was really noted yesterday was the, the number of students that were on that uh, you know, 330 bus out of North Vancouver, and it was a long bus mm -hmm. because I had time. And, and, and the politeness of the students, uh, thanking the driver every time they got off the bus. And, uh, and I just wonder what they were. were. Are they on free passes or what are, what are they doing over there? So they, it, uh, um, and, and it just, um, uh, I wonder if we know the implication of giving children and families free passes on the bus. And we'll get more people on the bus, I, 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 no doubt, but it's a subsidy, subsidy that can we afford to do. Okay, folks, I'm going to suggest that we move the recommendations by staff first, get that, get the fair review underway, and then we can argue about a further motion on this. Would that be a reasonable process to? Um, I call it point of order, that we actually have a motion. Oh, we have a second. Do we know what it is, Tracy? No. Okay. We need to know what our motion is. Uh, Director Seegers, can you can you take another oh my goodness. Um, go at that, please? That staff investigate how to implement a discounted youth and family pass for transit 
to be implemented before the end of this fiscal year, so at the end of December 2019, and bring back steps to the board for information and potential implementation. It's not quite what I said before, but that would, yeah, we want cost, cost implications as well, if we can. Staff, please. Um, one of the questions I have is what I discussed with BC Transit is what is the definition currently used in other systems around what is a family pass? Currently, the, the old programs in place around which are in some way called, some shape or form, are called a family pass, allows for an adult to be on the bus with uh, up to four, uh, four children. Uh, where the f children would get a free ride. That's what's currently considered the family pass. I'm not sure if that's what your, what's your, our, what your definition is of the family pass. Thank you. Dr. Right. Pratt. Well, I, I, have a, I have a good friend that has eight children. So um, I, I think the, the, the family pass, I'm, I'm okay with uh, like, <sighs> I think we need to be a little bit more flexible. So whether or not it's a shared pass amongst a family, or whether or not it is uh, a parent with children on the bus, um, I, I think the big thing is we want to increase ridership. We want to provide a better transit system for our youth and family that are living here on the coast. It's it's an expensive place. So I mean, how do there's, there's different options, there's different definitions. I would, you know, I, I'm fine to defer to, to see what BC Transit is doing in other jurisdictions. I've done some, you know, looking around myself and I've, I've seen it's quite the gamut, it depends on the community. And so we need to just find something that works for our community in that definition of family pass. Do we know what our motion on the floor is? Could, could you read it back? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have notes that you want staff to investigate a mechanism to move forward with discounted youth and family passes for transit to be implemented before the end of 2019 and bring back steps to the board with cost implications. That sounds good. Is the mover and the seconder happy with that? All right. I'd like to call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? All right, that passes. Just yes. Uh, can can we? Would somebody look, like to move the recommendations, staff report, Director Hills? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I would like to move them. The staff recommendations, as in the report. Do we have a seconder? Good. I'm going to call the question on that too. All in favor? Any opposed? Good. Thank you. That passes. Uh-oh, it's Director Pratt. <laughs> there is <laughs> our, um, so there is, uh, there is still one more piece that isn't uh, encompassed in, the, um, in any of the recommendations that we've put forward, um, and that's around the school district. And uh, I think it's really important that uh, we look at that. So, um, I, uh, so uh, whether or not um, it's most appropriate for staff or most appropriate for us at the elected level to speak with them because it is a budgetary piece. Um, it might be it might be a good conversation starter at uh, as a I don't know chair to chair uh, to speak on the outside um, first. So uh, I guess I'm going to make a motion that. Uh, the uh, chair and vice chair set up a meeting um, to talk with the chair and the vice chair of the school board regarding uh, transportation options. Good. That's straightforward. No, seeing no discussion, all in favor? Any opposed? Good. That passes. Thank you very much. 
And thank you to Mr. White for an excellent letter. All right, next item seven, transit expansion MOU. Staff, please. Sorry, thank you, Chair McMahon. The purpose of this report is to provide an update on transit service expansions and to seek direction regarding next steps. Any transit service expansion would need to be included in the transit expansion memorandum of understanding with our partner, BC Transit. There are currently no expansions scheduled for 2020, and the earliest possible expansion date would be April 1st, 2021. And those would need to be confirmed to BC Transit by Q1 in Q1 2020. Staff are recommend, recommending to confirm the feasibility um, of two possible expansion options for implementation in 2021 and work with BC Transit to develop a project plan to update the transit future plan as adopted in 2014 to guide future expansion decisions. Staff will be pleased to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Director Seegers? Just a clarification. You said in Q1 2020, we would need to identify what we would like to see in the expansion plans for mid or later 2021. Is that correct? The fiscal year from BC Transit, which is also the year um, for our annual operating agreement, is from April 1st to April 1st. So next Q1, we would need to identify what would need to be included in um, the memor and memorandum of understanding that would be brought back to this board uh, for approval in Q2 or early Q3 of 2020 to allow for its implementation in 2021. Thank you. Director Beamish. I'd like to move the recommendations to the top of the page, both of them. Second. All right. Any further discussion on the recommendations? Director Seegers? Thank you. Inside of that, is there then discussion with Town of Gibson's District of Seashout, SCRD planning staff on uh, potential plans and things that are, are moving forward? Um, Gibson's has some projects that are moving forward, affordable housing projects, for example. Um, I know we have some moving forward in Seashout, which could potentially impact ridership in these different areas and could impact some of the routes that have been put forward previously. So is that part of what happens inside of this or do they look at the transit future plan that we currently have on the books and go based on that? As part of the transit future plan um, update as suggested by BC Transit earlier this year, that would include a revision of uh, development, uh, pressures, et cetera, et cetera. So it would include uh, uh, to confirm the match between uh, demand, uh, supply, as well as um, consideration of impacts of an increased um, ferry schedule uh, in upcoming years. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Director Julius. Any, uh, any further comments? Uh, Director Pratt. Uh, uh, a comment um, because uh, I know it's in uh, watching our, the news that's coming out from um, the Northern Re Regional District of, of Quetet um, up in and the Powell River, the town of Powell River is one thing they're really going to be pushing us on, especially um, when we meet with them and every time we see them now is uh, is that extension of service all the way up to Earl's Cove so that there is a ferry to ferry on the lower Sunshine Coast. Um, so it's, I know in reading through the, um, taking a quick scan of the transit uh, future plan, um, I know it, it is still long term for us and I know there, um, there, there's a, but there's a big concern because Powell River is, uh, is not being serviced by um, anything beyond uh, the end of Halfman Bay. So they're, um, it's a big concern for them for uh, providing transit certainty. Good comment. Okay. Seeing no further, 
or is that a further comment? Just a quick further comment, because it is such a large regional issue, it might be something to bring up provincially, maybe um, Modi about uh, some kind of provincial funding, because that is, it is part of our, our transportation corridor and our part of our, um, it, it's so important for here on the coast, especially as we are looking at trying to reduce single occupancy vehicles. Um, so I think it's a larger discussion that we need to bring to the province as well. Director Beamish. I guess the corollary to that would be, is uh, <coughs> Powell River providing service to Salter Bay? They are already, so, the, so there's all, that piece is already in place. Oh, good. <clears throat> Batten down your hatches over there. All right. I'm going to call the question on this motion. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. That passes. Uh, Director Seegers. Thank you. I just want to make a comment um, on page 15. It indicates that service priority three, providing service to Chattelich School, will be implemented as of October 15th, 2019. So currently there is no uh, bus service to Chat High School. Um, we were waiting for one of the uh, routes to open up, one of the roads to open up, so it looks like this will happen. Um, and then I, I, I believe that we'd probably notify the school district and the high school and let them know it's happening. Yeah, that has all been uh, consulted with prior to uh, this date. Good, thank you everyone. Next item, item eight, rural areas curbside food waste collection service report. Over to staff, please. Thank you, Chair McMahon. A recent board direction outlined the service delivery model for our curbside food waste collection service for those residences in SCRD electoral areas B, D, E, and F that currently receive garbage collection. However, the estimated cost of the service is not included in the 2019 to 2023 financial plan, and thus staff cannot yet proceed to RFP. So the purpose of this report is to seek board approval of a budget for the curbside food waste collection service and to amend the financial plan accordingly to allow for procurement to proceed. And thank you and staff welcome the opportunity to answer any of the committee's questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions, especially rural director? Director Tice. Uh, Page 22, it says uh, there's uh, an eligible, uh, th that some some properties are eligible uh, for a fee reduction, and I, I'm wondering, uh, for waste collection, and uh, I'm wondering what that eligible criteria is. Uh, thank you for the question. I can read it directly from our bylaw number 431. So the eligible property means property that is, one, liable to property taxation, and two, owned by a person entitled to receive the additional homeowner's grant in respect of that property. And the eligible property reduction means an amount equal to the portion of the additional homeowner's grant that an owner in an eligible property was unable to claim during the year for which the charge under section 1.0 is payable to a maximum of, in this case, it's 154.25, which is the annual fee for 2019 in respect of any property. I can clarify too that that mainly applies to mobile home parks where the value of the property is low enough that they aren't able to use their full homeowner grant. And I wasn't aware of that program. It's very interesting. Director Seegers. Thank you. Uh, the District of Seashield at recently, I think it was a year ago or so, implemented the same program based on what the regional district was doing. And as uh, Director McMahon was saying, it was in response to um, input from our mobile home parks as well. Do we have further questions or do we have anybody who would like to move the staff recommendation? Director Tice. Um, I have one more question and uh, I'm just one wondering as to uh, the process and, and why quarter two 2020 is currently being considered as the earliest possible start date and 
and why we can't move it up to the same time as around the uh, food waste collection, which hopefully is done a little bit earlier. Question for staff on timing. Uh, thank you for the question. Essentially, timing. So uh, this report, if approved at committee, will go to the October 10th board. Uh, if it passes there, then that gives staff the authority to issue a request for proposals. So there's that preparation period, issue, close, evaluate, back to committee, back to board, contract award, um, and then from there, preparing with the successful proponent for procurement of containers and rollout and education. Thank you. Certainly not forgetting education because that's really crucial. Uh, all right. Anything further from directors? Director Seekers. Did we move those recommendations on page whatever that is? 19? If not, I'll move them as presented. Second, okay. Do we have any further discussion of the recommendations on page 19? Seeing none, uh, everybody votes except A. And uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. That passes. So, next item is food waste drop-off program considerations. Over to staff. Thank you, Chair McMahon. The SCRD's Regional Organics Diversion Strategy identifies implementing food waste drop-offs in Pender Harbor, Mid Coast and South Coast as an initiative to support a landfill ban for food waste. The objective of food waste drop offs are to remove barriers to participation and to maximize diversion. To determine the scope of a food waste drop off program, staff prepared three options that consider the number of sites, program users, volume restrictions, and cost recovery. The purpose of this report is to seek board direction regarding the scope of a 2020 budget proposal for implementation of a food waste drop-off program. And thank you, and staff welcome the opportunity to answer any of the committee's questions. Director Tai. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think um, those uh, collection depots are uh, a good idea. Um, I believe there's already one at Salish Soils. Um, so uh, I don't know whether the SCRD needs to put one mid-coast um, because there's already one there. Um, I, uh, Gibson's already has some curb, uh, has curbside and we're hoping to implement curbside in, in our electoral areas as well, uh, except for area A. So I, I, I think the one, uh, I think, was it option two? Um, where we only have one at the Pender Harbor Transfer Station sounds like the best uh, rationale to me. Uh, I, I don't see the... Uh, I, what I do want to see, though, is, is that uh, small-volume commercial operators can also drop there uh, with a volume restriction of maybe 50 liters. Um, just because you're commercial, but if you're on under 50 liters, I think I'm, I, I, I personally would be okay with that um, so that they wouldn't have to drive all the way to Salish Soils to drop that off. Director Seegers. Thank you. Um, I know Salish Soils has one. Does Gibson's have a, a place for uh, green, waste. green waste, but what not organics? No, the organic drop off. Okay, thank you. Director Hiltz. Uh, thanks, uh, Captain. Um, the, the sheet of paper that circulated um, in terms of the, the residential, who would be using the service? And so it, it looks like roughly 300 residential properties wouldn't be using the service, so the service would be dominantly business. Is there an anticipation of who, of, of the potential users for the service? Or the program, I should say, program. I'm just doing, going to jump in here and ask for a motion to receive a piece of paper. And seconded. All in favor, thank you. Okay, staff, uh, question? Thank you for the question. 
So the residents that uh, could use the program would really be those that are um, or seasonal or uh, not permanently living on the coast for them to be able to drop off uh, their organics um, if they're not on the coast during a regular pickup, um, as well as those residents that are currently not being served by our garbage collection given the routes, and that those are indeed the 300 you're referring to. And in the case of Pender, which is uh, Pender Area A, which is currently not on list, of course there is it is uh, open to the entire uh, all the residents. Director Hill. Uh, so the follow-up is, do and in the commercial sector, um, options for them to have food waste drop-off, right? Um, does the SCRD have to provide that, or would that be could be it be a, a private? Thanks for the question. Right now, if a commercial business uh, would like to participate in a food waste diversion program, they could hire a private contractor to haul it. Um, I believe small volumes are accepted at Salish Soils as well, so they could self-haul. Director Lee. Um, in Pender, we have a private uh, company doing garbage pickup. Um, I'd like to see them do the food, food waste separate and pick it up at the same time, but he wouldn't want to drive down to Seashell to get rid of it. He'd want to get rid of it at the Pender transfer station at the same time he dumped the um, garbage. Um, and I think it's a good idea. And I was wondering how that concept would fit into here. Uh, that would require a separate service with separate costing uh, required just to determine what the details and how that would work up at the Penda Harbor transfer station. I'm just going to comment that um, while I like the motion to try it at Pender Harbor, but um, there are a lot of seasonal residents and particularly um, commuters who uh, can't, can't uh, effectively use our uh, current garbage pickup system. So having uh, a drop-off point at the south coast would be uh, very beneficial. Director. Thank you. I mean, I agree with you, but this is only looking at organics. We don't have currently a drop-off for seasonal residents or for local residents who won't be here for their garbage pickup day. So this isn't addressing you know, it's addressing part of the need, but I don't think it's addressing the need that we have. Well, I remember from my tour of Gibson's Recycling that there is a very limited garbage uh, drop-off available there, though it's charged for, understandably. So, yeah, we're not really getting there, but we're moving incrementally towards improvements. Do we have any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Yes, it was seconded. Uh, yes, can, can we read the motion back? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Infrastructure Services Committee recommended that staff prepare a 2020 budget proposal for one food waste drop-off site at the Pender Harbor Transfer Station for residents and small businesses only funded from tipping fees with a volume restriction of 50 liters. Yeah, I'm, I, I think I might oppose this just because I think we should look at a South Coast site as well. All right, in that case, I'm going to call the question. Uh, Director Lee. One, one more question before before you call the question, Captain. Um, <laughs> if, if people are, delivered, or are uh, dropping these off, they're probably doing so at the same time they're dropping garbage off in Pender. So I guess the concept is, is that it would be by weight including 
what they are dropping off with garbage, not a separate heap. And if, uh, if is, do I have that correct? They would, uh, residents or small businesses would be charged for their garbage as and separately for their organics. If, if option two, uh, the tipping fee, um, funded by tipping fee is, is, is uh, the recommended option. Director Lee. More or less than regular garbage. That's a good question. Ideally, it's less because uh, there are regular garbage, which currently includes the organics. That's not, uh, they're not charged for their volume, they're charged under the organics rate. But it will be till, still charged for the entire uh, volume that they're, they're delivering to the transfer station. Director Tice. Um is there a way that we maybe we can uh, amend the motion um, so that it, we can have a uh, one site and a two site option and then uh, we look at it at the budget proposal time? Which isn't any of the options available at this point, but one for the Pender Harbor and one for the South Coast. Mm -hmm. Director Seeger? I might be willing to, to uh, second the amendment if I really understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Are you saying you want, you would like two budget proposals come back, uh, one for the Pender Harbor as proposed and yeah. the other for a south coast site? So they would come as separate budget um, items. Well, I think uh, we either, either a budget proposal that I think a budget proposal that has both and then, then a budget proposal that has one. Yeah, so so you don't need to do, I guess either way, you, you can skin that cat in both ways, but yeah. In other words, yes. you want to be able to distinguish what the cost of each would be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll second that motion. Or second the amendment. Over to staff for a rescue at sea. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Um, I would appreciate some direction on how that South Coast uh, facility uh, should be funded, tipping fee, taxation, or combination. And second question, I, um, second item I would like to um, have the board consider is that there's no guarantee that current um, private business um, opportunity for drop-off at mid-coast is guaranteed moving forward. And that's why staff recommendation, one of the, in one of the options was to make that an SJD service instead of a separate business um, venture. Thank you. Director Seegers. Thank you. I think we were, the initial um, view of the board was Area A won't be having organics pickup, which is why we were looking at having a drop off location there. The rest of the Sunshine Coast, I believe, is looking at implementing organics pickup. So we would only be looking at a location on the south coast for those who are commuters and moving, like going back and forth and not around. I, I think that was kind of the rationale that's, that I've heard here. If it's different, then we might, or small commercial, right? Or So if it's, well, if small commercial, then we also need something in Seashell for small commercial. So we need to be clear about what our rationale is to see what we put forward here. Yes, and I, ha I hate to say this too, but we, we need to think a little bit about fully funded from taxation or recovered from tipping fees. Uh, personally, the tipping fees part, I think, would be somewhat cumbersome to implement because then you've got to have somebody there to collect it and weigh it and everything else. And I'm not convinced that that is the most efficient way to get the job done, especially if we're trying to encourage people to drop off their organics. So we have uh, a motion on the floor. Do we wish to amend the motion? Do we wish to 
seconded amendment i beg your pardon so the amendment that we are looking at right now is to what the heck was the amendment to two sites two sites all right but funding needed to be identified for the second site so it sounds like the motion needs a little work yet so let's defeat it and start over <laughs> yes I'm going to call the motion. I'm going to call the motion. The question here. So every on the amendment. Okay, all in favor of the amendment. Anyone opposed? We are all opposed. Good. And now I'm calling the motion. So all in favor of the motion. No, but oh, we got one in favor. Oh, good. Any opposed? Uh, we've got several opposed. So that that is defeated. Uh, can we? Can can we try again here, folks? I think we need to identify the sites, the users, the volume restriction, and the cost recovery. And it looks like we are edging up towards option 1A. Director Seeger. I think the, the only concern I have about this is the um, commercial. How do, we, how do we stay with small commercial and not have large commercial come in, or do we want large commercial too, and then we just fund it through taxation and everybody dumps their stuff there? That's maximum diversion is what we're, get, we're getting with that, but it does mean that we would potentially be subsidizing commercial operations. I, I believe there is a volume restriction, however. Right, of 50 liters. Yeah. Well, if there is a restriction, it has to be monitored. Right. So. However, uh, please somebody make a motion. Oh, Director Julius. It's not a motion that I want to make. I just want to, I want to, well, I guess make the motion to go with uh, the recommendation by staff. And all these other new items that are now coming to that are being brought forward to to bring that up as another item, and then staff come to us with a report on on these new items that is coming from the board. Director Seegers, I'll move at option one A. Do I see a seconder for option 1A as recommended by staff? Okay, we have a seconder. Yay. All right. Is there any further discussion, Director Pratt? I would put a cautionary um, into uh, going for 1A above 1B. And I understand the concern around the administrative costs and administrative kerfuffle with, um, with having tipping fees. However, um, we, if it's with, if it's, if the uh, cost of uh, getting rid of your food waste is within your taxes, it's not always immediately within your face of how much you're throwing away and how much it's costing you. So I personally would prefer 1B. Um, however, uh, so I would, I would speak in favor of 1B. I'd speak in favor of, of defeating the 1A for a 1B, um, but I'm willing to go with the will of the board, but at the same time, just caution you. Director Hiltz. Uh, thanks, thanks, Captain. Yeah, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the user pay, for, for me, this just brings back the whole green waste, where it started off as, uh, uh, we, we ended up at a, as a taxation and we were trying to do user pay. So for me, the 1B establishes a bit of a compromise between, uh, and it, it's something that could be changed in the future if the, if the 1B option didn't turn out. So I'm, to, to me, is 1B is getting my, our feet wet but not going the whole way. To, to, um, and, and it does put some obligation on the user to be aware of, of their cost in disposing of the food waste. So I, I'm, I'm more in the 1B camp. Director Ties. My problem with 1B is, is that I, I'm suspicious that uh, 
all the tipping fees we'll collect will um, will not even pay for the people that are, are actually going to be doing the weighing. Um, so uh, that that's my suspicion, and uh, and all the infrastructure that needs to be in place for that. So uh, I, that's why I'm going with one A. Director Beamish. I think that my view tipping when when you start charging the tipping fee. Um, people are going to just throw it in the garbage. It's just not going to show up and because you got to have whatever amount of money in your, cap, your pocket or credit card to to go to the dump again, so they drop it off. So I think if you go with Fun A, you're going to you're going to capture the material. You're going to encourage people to to uh, uh, to use the service, and um, and they're going to pay for it their taxation. They will there will be a cost. And uh, I'm I'm with him. Uh, yeah, I I, and we are not making a final decision here. We're just asking for a report. So, Director Seegers. Now, this would actually let staff go out to RFP. I understand. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, we're. It's a budget proposal. Ah, okay, sounds good. Um, the other side for me always when I'm looking at these kinds of conversations is the diversion. You know, if we have, a, what is the cost to us if we uh, don't divert it from the landfill? So, yes, it's going to cost us to have people do this, but we, I think we gain on the other end. As long as we can, if we can push that out further, buy us some time. So I'm going to call a question because we've got a lot more to do today. So we're voting on option 1A. All in favor? Any opposed? One opposed? That passes. Did you want your opposition recorded, Director Pratt? No. Okay. Look, uh, so the next item, item 10, it has been suggested by staff that we defer that to a future meeting. Uh, what meeting are we deferring it to? I, item 10, the curbside recycling. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Uh, it, it is a report. We don't have to make a decision about it at this time. Um, Director Beamish. If I may, uh, then, if we're, if we're going to defer it, talk about process and implications for establishing curbside uh, um Side, recycling. Uh, one thing the implication doesn't take into consideration is potential impact on the Gibson's recycling depot, and I wonder if that could be looked at in, uh, by staff in, when it comes back, because the potential there of uh, recycled materials coming from Area D um, could impact the Gibson's recycling depot. Over to staff. Those impacts are currently included on page 33 of the report at a certain level and are also in more detail included in a report uh, earlier from earlier this year. Director Seegers. And just a question for clarification. If I read this correctly, we're looking at establishing curbside recycling potentially for B and D, but no curbside recycling for E and F. Is that correct? Yes, that's according to the direction from the board we received on in uh, June from this year. Director Beamish. I guess I'm just seeing on, on page 33, I see reference to the impact of uh, reduced tonnage of material to the seashell depot, but is there a similar comment on the Gibson's depot? Over to staff, please. If if curbside recycling is implemented in B and D only, that would mean electoral areas E and F, as well as the town of Gibsons, would not have curbside recycling, and that does not change the financial incentives that are received for the depot located in Gibsons. Director Tice. Yeah, well, I'm, first of all, I'm curious as to why we would want to defer this. Um, I was ready to make a motion on this, but uh, 
maybe I'll put that to staff. We just have time constraints. We're about to go in camera, and we are already at 12.30, so that's, that's the reason. Are we able to defer this to the committee this afternoon? All right. Can I have a motion to do so? Ms. Pratt, uh, Director Pratt moves that we defer this to the committee this afternoon. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we, we just ran out of gas here or, or uh, wind in our sails. Yes. Um, I do apologize. All right. Uh, we are about to... Um, a motion to receive the correspondence. Oh, yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, let us receive the correspondence. Seconded. Okay, all in favor? Yes. Good. I don't think we have anything arising from the correspondence that we... Uh, Director Beamish. Uh, not from correspondence, but uh, given that the uh, uh, Gibson's depot operator is here, could uh, staff maybe talk to him to see if he has any thoughts about whether or not this would impact him, that... Resolution just so we can know. Yes, we'll we'll do so. Thank you. Ready for their patience. Uh, we are about to entertain a motion to go in camera. Uh, motion to go in camera. Anyone? Yes. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you very much. And now, do we have questions? No, no questions from the fifth estate. No questions from the floor? Yes, you may now do a brief hornpipe. Thank you. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you very much. So we have a motion to stay in camera. Have, have the Pauls in camera. All right. Thank you. <laughs> 